Hello. So, uh, good morning. In uh, today's session, I will be presenting some very interesting case studies on uh, blackouts and how they occur. And uh, we'll see some of the uh, reasons for the blackout and how very large blackouts, you know, which ca cause billions of dollars of loss can be caused by some very simple events. So this is Professor Umar Rao from RV College of Engineering bringing you the lectures under the e-sectional program of VT. Now, in a large grid, many areas are interconnected. So these areas could be, uh, uh, you know, geographically within the country, if within one country, or smaller countries could be, you know, transferring power from one to the other and so on. So what you have to understand is in an integrated grid, the characteristics of different regions in the grid will be widely different. The characteristics will be widely different. So let us take our Indian grid for you to understand what I'm trying to say. If you look at the uh, Indian uh, grid, uh, the Northern grid, you know, it's a deficit region. That means deficit in generation. Always the demand is higher. And um, it has low hydro potential and adverse weather conditions, extreme weather conditions in the north of India. Now, if you look at northeast, uh, they are not very developed. Industrial development is low. And um, so the load in general is low, but there is very good potential for idle power. But the Himalayas is a problem there and you do evacuating power generated would pose a problem. If you look at northeast, north, the east, sorry, east of India, eastern region, there again, it's, they're not very highly developed. They have low loads, but very good coal reserves. So thermal plants. Coming to the west, west is highly industrialized. South also. All the IT companies are all based in the south and a lot of public sector units, very, very industrialized. And uh, so the load is very heavy. And um, but the uh, lot of hydel plants are there, which is heavily dependent on the monsoon. So what am I trying to tell you with, uh, with this slide? You know, in any grid, the different regions of the grid will have entirely different characteristics. So how you control will depend on how they are interconnected, where is the power transfer and so on. And as the grids grow bigger, control becomes more complex, though reliability does improve because the entire concept of building larger grids is to facilitate power transfer from one region to the other. So today the whole of India is one national grid. And uh, so, which essentially means that if you have a blackout, you could have a blackout from Kashmir to Kanyakumari. You can imagine uh, the kind of loss which the country will have to bear if God forbid anything like that happens. So the case studies I'm going to present will uh, show you uh, how uh, you know, blackouts occur starting from very simple um, instances and it's simple incidents. Now, let's see some of the challenges. You just see here, how do I even uh, uh, transmit power or if there is a good hydel potential and uh, there is a capacity for generate, building the generating station itself would pose a major challenge and then transfer, evacuating the power through mountainous region would be a very, very big challenge right look at a connection like this very typical in our country okay so how do i ensure reliability how do i ensure protection and on the distribution side okay how do i even do a fault finding how do i prevent major faults hmm? and this is typically a scene of a blackout right? So a blackout has occurred. 
there is absolutely no uh, no power and this is a scene from actual scene um, from a blackout so this i have taken the photograph from one of the biggest blackouts in history so when did this occur this occurred in um, 2003 and at that time 65 gigawatts of power it's huge of 65000 megawatts we are talking of 65000 megawatts of power uh, lost because of the blackout so this occurred in north america and parts of canada in the august of 2003 so this is one case study i really love because it uh, illustrates beautifully how small things can lead to catastrophic uh, events. So I am presenting you the case study minute to minute. What happened? So at 12.15, a system monitoring tool in Ohio state became ineffective. So the first energy corporation is uh, in charge there uh, for the supply and that their uh, control room, they found that a monitoring tool became ineffective. Okay, this was observed at 12.15. And at 1.31, about one and a half, one hour, 15 minutes later, the Ohio plant shut down. Right, for some reason, the plant shut down. Then after another half an hour, what happened? Uh, a 345 kV line got outaged. Okay, the line was opened due to contact with trees. This is very common with overhead lines. See, overhead lines which run in cities, very often, you know, the trees grow above them. So these lines touching the trees is not an uncommon uh, feature so it will cause a short circuit the reason is trees have sap so they are conducting bodies that's why you will find typically during monsoon you know in in uh, karnataka the best form comes and they clear all the trees they prune the trees so that when it rains uh, it prevents uh, at inadvertent short circuits so this is what happened at two two o'clock two p.m 345 kv line that's a high transmission line 345 kV is a transmission line. Now, please remember a 345 kV line would be carrying substantial power. Right? On the transmission side, the power will be quite high carried by a line. Now, what will happen if one line becomes outaged? There are other, it's a meshed system, isn't it? So the power which was carried by this line will get redistributed amongst the other powers, uh, other lines. How this redistribution will take place will depend on the interconnection. For example, if you had a parallel line, simply it will get transferred to the parallel line. Okay. Otherwise, it will depend on how it is connected. And based on KCL and KVL, you can solve and see how the power is redistributed. So in this process, what will happen is some other line may get overloaded because that line was carrying some power X. Now, because some other line got out, it will carry now X plus Y, which may be more than its capacity. So another line may get overloaded. So here, this is typically what happened. So in another less than 10 minutes, around 10 minutes, one more, 138 kV line. This is in the lower, the primary distribution, 138 kV. That also failed because it got overloaded, right? So you see what happened first one 345 kV line failed transmission side then after about half an hour another 345 kV line failed because of overloading then it crept up to the lower level 138 kV line failed again because of overloading look at the time it's 339 so there's a one hour gap because the lines don't trip as soon as there is an overload Clear. You should understand the difference between overloading and fault. In both cases, the current will increase, but the overloading will not be very heavy, around 20%, 30%. Whereas faults will cause currents five times, six times, five per unit, six per unit will be fault currents. So when a fault occurs, the relays will trip. 
immediately based on whatever is the small time delay you have given. You would have studied the inverse characteristic of a relay operation. So within a few cycles, the relay and the breakers will trip in case of a fault. But in case of overloading, the line will not trip immediately. There, the increase in current is sensed by the thermal action, the heating of the conductor. Clear? So there will be sufficient time, one hour, one and a half hours or two hours, depending on the level of overloading, before the line trips because overloading is a very normal condition it keeps happening so you can't keep tripping a line the moment the overload occurs so to sense overloading the thermal effect is used so if you see there you know there's a gap one hour gap from 227 to 339 it's more than an hour so the 138 kv line failed so on the distribution side what happens immediately there are you know the power has to get redistributed so in just two minutes, please see that it is 339 and then it is 341, just two minutes, another 15, 138 KV lines tripped. Clear. Now, so I have from 1215 to 345, almost three and a half hours time is there. What could have been done in this time? When the first line got outaged, the second line got overloaded. In the control room, this overloading will be visible to the operator. But what happened? Look at the first thing. The monitoring tool had failed in the control center. So the operator did not have an idea that this line has got overloaded. If the operator had an idea that the line was overloaded, the operator could have done some load shedding. Okay, this load shedding could have prevented the overload, but the operator did not see it, did not sense it. So as a result in this three hours, in the 138, in the primary distribution side about 15, 16 lines tripped. So now what has happened? There was a, a deep voltage sag in Ohio. The voltage was much less than what is uh, required below the standards. So you know the moment the voltage comes down, all the generators, loads, they all have over voltage, under voltage, over frequency, under frequency. I told you, relays. So in about four minutes, by 4.10, the Eastern Michigan grid got disconnected. Okay. Now you see, I have started marking the time in seconds also. 4, 10, 37, 4 p.m., 10 minutes, 37 seconds, Eastern Michigan disconnected. Then you see what happens if one, already there is a problem with imbalance because some lines have got outdated. With this one, one part of the grid has got disconnected. So there'll be even more imbalance. So there will be a havoc with the frequency. And, and look at that in, in about seven, eight seconds. Western New York grid also got disconnected in about eight seconds. And then in about one minute later, 256 power plants went offline. What will happen? Let us say it's overloaded. Frequency will drop. The moment frequency drops, one generator will go out of step. It will trip. As it is, your frequency has dropped because the generation is less. Now one more generator goes out. So the frequency will further drop and in no time, all the generators will trip. So you just see in, in less than one minute, 256 power plants went offline. So in that North American grid, 85% of the power was cut off and it was a total grid collapse. And I'm talking of 2003, almost 18 years back. Yeah, August. So to, now, now we are uh, in August. Uh, Six billion US dollars was lost then. And a total of 65 megawatts of power, gigawatts of power or 65,000 megawatts of power was lost. And it took about 72 hours to bring back the grid into action. 
So just look at the sequence of events, right? Pay attention to the time. So as you reach the distribution side, the fault reaches the distribution side, you don't have much time and then with cascading effect, everything is blown off in seconds. So the whole thing starting from 12.15 to then in four hours, everything was uh, over, you can say. Now the first energy, now you have to come to the root. So what they did, they gave three consultants to find out what was the reason. See, when a blackout occurs, it feels good to think there is some big reason. You know, some real technical issue is there or some operational flaw or something, nothing. This Hannah Juniper company, they confirmed that the root cause of all this was that the trees were not cut. So if you look at this here, you know, two o'clock, the line outage due to contact with trees. This is what happened. The fact that the operator did not know about the overloading because of a software failure is different. Whether you can call that as the cause, I don't know. But the actual cause is this. So they said, after a detailed report, that the cause of the blackout was the contact of the trees. So you see here how high the trees are. This is from that same area. So they go and touch. So they touched the 345 kV line. Normally, 345 kV lines are high because they're transmission, no? they're higher. But then it did happen because you have huge trees. So they said that was the reason. And this is what happens typically because of ambient condition, temperature rise, the lines will sag and you can make easily, you can make contact with trees. Okay. Then the first energy that was a corporation in charge in Ohio, um, what all they found, you know, what were the root causes they analyzed? Very interesting. First, the first energy the analysis, the, uh, the consultants told, the First Energy Corporation did not ensure a reliable system after contingencies occurred because it did not have an effective contingency analysis capability. Today things are much better, you know, because we have faster computers and we have a lot of communication, faster communication. This is in those days, 2003, we are talking about. So they said that the system was not reliable because I did not have a contingency analysis in place. So what does the contingency analysis do? If a fault occurs now, what will be its consequence? I assess that and take a suitable control measure. That was not done. Next, they said that the operators were not aware of how to monitor the status using the monitoring tool. That means lack of operators training. So they also said that, you know, there was a monitoring tool failure. I told you at 12 o'clock. They did not have a procedure to know that the tool has failed. They came to know only later after analysis and taking data logs, etc. They knew that the um, tool had failed because whatever I presented to you the previous slide is after the event has occurred, they have analyzed and they have even at this time, this, 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 this happened. But supposing in the control room, the monitoring tool fails, there is no, nothing, there is no test or validation to say that your tool has failed. So the operator does not even know that the operator is operating with a flawed monitoring tool. Clear. And Yes, you must have some redundant monitoring tools in case of alarms. So all these were lacking. So this was what was um, the analysis. Okay. Then the other group, one more group, they said again the same thing. Uh, tree management did not cut the trees on time. And the third group, I told you there were three groups, three consultants. Uh, were asked to work out and analyze the situation. They uh, said that the state estimator uh, failed due to a data error. So what happens is in the control centers, we have state estimators which take measurements in real time and estimate the state of the system. 
That means what is the state? And in this state, if a fault occurs, what is likely the effect of that? That estimation should be done. They failed in that. Okay, so that was another thing. And the monitoring tool did not have real time line information to detect overloads. Okay, apart from the software, there was no other real time detection which could alert the operator that an overloading has occurred. A simple load shedding would have prevented this 65 gigawatt of blackout. But the operator did not even know that a low overloading had occurred. And the operators were not trained to link the breaker status to the line status to understand how the condition has changed. So you see, and the visibility of the grid was not wide. This was a very big learning experience. That means sitting at Ohio, they did not even envision that one line tripping in Ohio can lead to a blackout in most of North America and uh, Southern Canada. That idea was not there. The wide area visibility. Okay. So a lot of things have changed from this. A lot of things have changed from this. And I presented to you this for you to understand what are the issues and how a simple event like not cutting a tree can lead to some catastrophic effect. And August 2003 was a very unlucky uh, period. Around the same time, there was a major blackout in London where uh, the central London, the, uh, the metro, the main transport in central London was hit by a power blackout and people were stranded uh, underground in the tunnels for almost eight hours. And uh, I'll tell you what was the reason. Very interesting. See, uh, the metro is fed by two stations. Okay. A lot of redundancy is there. Each because metro is very important. It's a very critical load. It's the main means of transport for the people in central London. So it is served by two stations. Each of them have the capacity to serve it individually, right? So two are connected so that even if one station is out, the other station can take up the entire metro load. So it is serviced by two stations and each station has a double circuit line capable of each of them capable of carrying the entire metro load. Yeah. So to give you an example, let me just, let us just assume that the metro, I'm not giving you actual figures. This is for you to understand. Let us assume the metro load is 500 megawatts. Okay. So there are two stations, both of which can serve 500 megawatts. So they have the capacity. Clear? And uh, under normal operating conditions, each station supplies half of it, 250 megawatts, and the remaining capacity is used to meet other loads. This is the first, there is redundancy in generation. So if one, generate, one station fails, the other station can take up the 500 megawatt load because it has the capacity. Now, from each station, there are double circuit lines, each of 500 megawatt capacity. That means one of the lines can carry the full metro load. So under normal what operating conditions, what is the scenario? I have two stations, each taking 250, 250. And from there, I have a double circuit parallel line. So each will carry 125, 125. So what the operators had done, under the worst scenario, my station will carry full 500 megawatts. So each of the line will carry 250 megawatts, though under normal operating conditions, it will be 125. So they had done the relay setting for 250 megawatts overload setting. The lines were 500, the lines were 500, but they thought, okay, even if this generation station supplies the, supplies the entire metro, I have a double line. So it will be 250, 250. And so the relay setting was for 250. On the day the blackout occurred, bad luck. This setting is perfect, no problem. What happened? One of the stations was down for maintenance. You know, there was some flaw, not maintenance. There was some, some problem with the generator and the station was uh, shut down. No problem because the other station is capable of supplying the full 500 megawatts. But then the line tripped. 
one of the lines was down in for maintenance scheduled maintenance so what was happening was a 500 megawatt line was carrying 500 megawatts of power that was not the problem the relay setting the over current relay setting of the 500 megawatt line was set for 250 megawatts because that was what they thought would be the worst case so here you see it was sheer bad luck that a station failed and at the same time the line was out for maintenance they happened simultaneously nobody thought that this situation will arise so though the line had capability the station had capability for a simple reason of a mal setting, a wrong setting of the relay, the line tripped. You know, to figure it out, it took about eight hours. Nobody knew what was happening. Hey, this capacity is there, the line is there. Why is it tripping? Why is it tripping? No fault is visible. And we know, you know, sometimes data recording is also very poor. So it took them about eight hours. People were stranded underground in the tunnels without light without power for eight hours and had it been in april peak of summer a lot of casualties would have been there hmm? so what is the reason for this blackout what would you say it was simply an incorrect correctly installed automatic protection relay which incorrectly read a change in power flow as a fault and disconnected an area it is, it is like fitting a one amp fuse instead of a five amp fuse. That's all. Right? So this was what happened. Now, again in the same year, in September, there was a major blackout in Italy. This is all, you know, photographs of Italy from that blackout. So the transmission lines from Switzerland through the Alps were knocked out. And there was power loss. So there's a power transfer there between Switzerland and Italy. So it led to a whole lot of cascading effect and power lost almost in entire Italy. What happened? A single line to ground fault occurred and the line was not restored. They were not able to restore this line. And this led to cascaded outages because of insufficient distance between conductors and trees conductors and cables and trees again we are back to the that case where the trees are touching the conductors simple simple thing like cutting the trees could have prevented it so there were a series of uh, events right now let us take our famous indian uh, blackout in 2012 right so you see, this is uh, the Indian grid, what I explained to you in the beginning of the session. I have the National Load Dispatch Center. Then we have the Southern region and the new grid. So at that time, this blackout occurred, the Southern grid was still not synchronized with the new grid. So the new grid consists of the Northern regional grid, the Western region, Eastern region, and Northeast. And the Southern region is SLDC, South. Southern Load Dispatch Center. Clear? So this was the situation then. Later in 2013, the Southern Grid was also synchronized and we have one national grid now. So this was the range of blackout. Can you see? Huge. Almost 50% of India. The Northern region, Eastern region, Northeast. South, since it was not synchronized, was buffered. Hmm? On 30th and 31st of July 2012. So look at this huge traffic jams everywhere. People stranded, you know, no power. So all your electric trains, metros, all stopped. Look at this. Hmm? So if we see the frequency profile as captured, okay, uh, there was a frequency drop in one region and a frequency increase in the other region. So this is what happens. You know, whenever a blackout, just before a blackout occurs, a group of generators called as coherent generators will accelerate and in that the frequency will go up and frequency will come down. A group of generators will decelerate, right? So now let us see what happened. Hmm? So 
Abina Gwalior link was outaged. It was a 400 kV uh, line, right? This was the starting point. And on 30th July, so it tripped the 400 kV Bina Gwalior line on zone three protection of distance relay because of load encroachment caused by the Northern region system to separate from the Western region. So the North summer, no, July, heavily loaded. So they were overdrawing power, over overdrawal of power. So because of that, there was heavy loading and the line tripped. Then there were weak corridors, which led to multiple outages. So the Northern region, high loading, what happened in this Bina Gwalior Agra link line? The Northern region utilized unscheduled interchange. See what happens? Every region will bid for the power, how much of power they are going to take. That is called as the scheduled interchange. So at the load dispatch centers, they would have planned for the scheduled um, power exchange. Now they do an overdrawal, unscheduled. So which led to heavy overloading. Okay. Now, they told the regional grids, you schedule the national load dispatch. They said, please shut down your loads, shut down your load. The frequency is dropping. No, nobody wants to shed the load, right? So what happened? Whatever responses the SLDCs, the state load dispatch centers did was not sufficient. And this led to, a, to the line uh, outage. So, and then it happened a series of cascaded effects and I showed you what the blackout um, that occurred. So entire region, there was a huge loss. Clear? So we have seen so many blackouts. So what, are, what, are, what all can cause it? When do you say the grid is heavily disturbed? There is an under voltage condition. Okay, which can lead to a voltage collapse. Voltage stability problem. Or there is an over voltage problem. There is an under frequency, heavy load, extreme overloading. So the under frequency relays will trip. So if you observe under frequency, you have to do load shedding. There is, the distribution companies have to resort to load shedding. Over frequency, excessive generation, so generators must be backed out, okay? Rate of rise of frequency, rapid fall or rapid rise in frequency, DF by DT. So that shows that, you know, there's a series of outages taking place. The frequency, steady state frequency will tell you whether there is overloading, underloading, but the rate of change of frequency will tell you how rapidly this is happening, okay? And it can be a blackout, a total blackout. All these conditions, we say the grid is disturbed. So you see it boils down to voltage and frequency. Voltage and frequency. Frequency means active power balance. Voltage means reactive power balance. Voltage is collapsing. Means improper, insufficient reactive power support. So we have, based on what I have discussed, we have the operating states. I have equality constraints and inequality constraints. Equality constraints means the active power and reactive power must be balanced, generation and load, load plus losses. Inequality constraints means your voltage, your frequency, your reactive power of the generators, etc. All these operating conditions should be within limits. Those are called as inequality constraints. So when we operate the system, both the equality constraints and inequality constraints must be satisfied. And when they are satisfied, we say the system is secure. Okay, I have buffer. If, if it gets, if the load increases, decreases, I can still maintain my stability. Now from the secure state, I can go to insecure state where the constraints are still satisfied, but the constraints are still satisfied, but 
I don't have security. I don't have a balance. If now a fault occurs, there is a possibility that I will become unstable. So some preventive control measure should be taken, like maybe the excitation uh, must be increased and so on. And we have to move from alert state to normal state. So this alert state is what was lacking in, in the first blackout of North America. There was an overloading. So security is reduced when there is an overload. And there should be an alert. Look, this line is overloaded. That alert will come in the control center. And that failed because the software had failed. So preventive measure, a simple small load shedding or something could have been done. It was not done. Right? Then from the alert state, I can move to an emergency state where inequality constraints are violated. That means the voltage go outside the limit. The voltage is below the you know, uh, threshold or above the threshold. Frequency is violated. The uh, reactive power limits are violated and so on. You have to take some emergency measure, maybe I line, remove a part of the grid from interconnection or maybe do heavy load shedding. They're all emergency measures. Okay, if you don't take it, then you will go into an extreme state where the equality constraints are also violated. That means the load is not met. The demand is not met. Equality constraints are violated. Inequality constraints are violated. So that will lead to a blackout. All limits are violated. It will lead to a blackout. So once you reach that stage, you have to restore. So after a blackout, what happens in a blackout? Total shutdown. Now you have to start up the generators, synchronize. You can't do everything simultaneously, little by little, right? So your equality constraints will not be met because you can't start all the load at one time. Different generating stations have different startup characteristics. Right? So thermal plants have different character characteristics. Hydel plants have different characteristics. Nuclear plants have different characteristics. It depends on the age, the type of fuel, the type of plant. So I can't start the entire grid in one shot. It has to be done in steps. So that is called as the restorative state. That's why in the restorative state, I put an E bar. Bar means equality constraints are not met because all my load, the system has reached a blackout. All my load cannot be served at the same time. So my equality constraints cannot be met. Slowly, I start, you know, synchronizing, starting the generators. And as and when I start the generators, I start adding load grid to the grid. So depending on the size of grid, this entire process from restoration state to normal state may take three days, 72 hours. And cause billions of dollars of loss today. Okay, it can be very, very bad. So this is what we uh, spoke about, whatever I told you. You have the normal operating states where both equality and inequality constraints are satisfied. You have the alert state where it is normal, but you don't have security. Then you have the emergency state where there is an imbalance of generation and demand and instability sets in. Okay, you have to take some strong control measure like load shedding, capacitor switching, uh, eye landing, that is breaking up of system, generator shedding, so on. And if you don't do it, you can move to the extreme state where everything is violated and leads to a blackout. And then you have to have a restorative state. Okay, so if you look at the major changes in the power systems today across the world, earlier we had large systems fewer in generation and today we have smaller resources they are more in number and we had long-term firm contracts between utility between the generator and the distributor today there are shorter contracts and we had bulk power transactions and we have less bulk power transactions and this has been complicated by the entry of renewable energy sources and we had a predictable range of operating conditions. Today, you have a less predictable range of operating conditions, okay? Because of diverse loads, diverse operating states, different controls, and so on. And we had limited utility players. 
but now we have many players lot of the sector has been privatized which has permitted many uh, players into the market and cost has become a major criteria earlier we used to operate the system with huge margins whereas today it is with limited capacity and uh, earlier the competition was limited because of you know privatization was still just starting today there is high competition and we have a lot of congestion today okay so the power sector has undergone a massive transition in the last 3 or 4 decades so to summarize let us just see what are the major causes some causes for blackout first and foremost lack of trimming of trees leading to a connection from the conductor to the ground and overestimation of the reactive power output of the generators you overestimate it may not be actually generating so much so you will have a voltage collapse possible lack of operators ability to predict no training not insufficient training of the operators non compliance with safety limits by the utilities so there are heavy penalties today and this has more or less come under control and lack of coordination in the system protection i i, I gave you that example of the london blackout the systems expand and somehow we we don't keep track of the protection when the system expands and what we have been doing with it then insufficient uh, communication between interconnected areas okay so these are some of the major causes of the blackout so um, uh, i hope uh, this session um, you know gave you some good insights into how blackouts can occur and today it is imperative that we prevent such blackouts because you know of the heavy industrialization and uh, so much of dependence on uh, on power a blackout can lead to unimaginable economic loss and maybe even human loss because all your air traffic control everything is automated everything depends on uh, electricity and hospitals they use so many gadgets and a failure can lead to fatal uh, lives being taken away and uh, so it is imperative today in the modern world to prevent a blackout thank you